Grace and peace. I'm Pastor Aaron Kerner, and I'm recording our third day Bible study from home. And I have a few reminders on the announcements. This coming Lord's Day, we have our prayer meeting at 10 o'clock in the morning. Our regular worship is at 11. We also will be celebrating the Lord's Supper. And Nate is scheduled to pray. Our Psalm of the Week is 132a, and we'll be talking about that and singing it shortly. On January 6th, we have our session and deacon meeting, and we'll be discussing our 2024 budget. January 7th, we have our 2 p.m. ordination and installation service of our deacons elect. And from the 12th through the 14th of January, we have a retreat scheduled for the building at and Floyd. And on January 14th, we have our next read through the Bible class. And we are in the book of 1 Samuel this month. And on January 21st, we have our 2 p.m. congregational meeting after the fellowship dinner. Our Psalm of the Week is 132a. This is a psalm of the Davidic covenant, which we'll be learning more about in our reading through the Bible when we get to 2 Samuel, and the Davidic covenant is found in 2 Samuel 7. And as we sing Psalm 132, uh, you might be wondering, why is this important, and why are we singing a 3,000-year-old hymn that has to do with David? Well, the, the simple answer is that because the Davidic covenant is fulfilled by Jesus. In Psalm 132, It was a prophecy about a thousand years before the ascension of Jesus to the right hand of God the Father. And now we are singing Psalm 132 in light of the ascension of Jesus to God's right hand. God had promised and sworn to David, as we'll sing in Psalm 132, that David would always have a descendant on his throne. So we are singing and we are praising God for the faithfulness of his covenant promises, which find their yea and their amen in the Lord Jesus Christ. And in last week's Bible study, which we'll be reviewing shortly, we learned about Bar Kokhba and how Bar Kokhba was a false messiah who was declared to be the son of David by Rabbi Akiva, who had subsequently and, and his disciples a tremendous influence on the formation of rabbinic Judaism. Now, Bar Kokhba claimed to be David's son, claiming and he was going to fight and win Jerusalem back from the Romans and establish his earthly throne. Remember that there hadn't been a descendant of David on a throne since 586 BC when the Babylonians raised Jerusalem to the ground. But of course, Bar Kokhba uh, was a liar and Rabbi Akiva didn't know the scriptures well enough to know a true Messiah from a false Messiah because Jesus is the Christ. He now sits at the right hand of God the Father. And this, of course, was proclaimed by the apostle Peter on the day of Pentecost about a hundred years before Bar Kokhba. Again, Bar Kokhba, Rabbi Akiva, should have known better. Now, in in Acts chapter 2, about 50 days after the Sanhedrin, uh, or members of the Sanhedrin, the high priest had handed Jesus over to Pontius Pilate to be crucified. About 50 days later, on the day of Pentecost in Jerusalem, this is where the church begins, the apostle Peter said, Brethren, I may confidently say to you regarding the patriarch David, that he both died and was buried and his tomb is with us to this day. And so because he was a prophet and knew that God had sworn to him with an oath, one of his descendants on his throne, he looked ahead and spoke of the resurrection of the Christ, that he was neither abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh suffer decay. And that's Psalm 16. And then Peter says, this Jesus God raised up again, to which we are all witnesses. And again, as he's speaking of the resurrection of Jesus, it's also in the context of his ascension. Therefore, Peter goes on to say, having been exalted to the right hand of God and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured forth this which you both see and hear. For it was not David who ascended into heaven, but he himself says, and now he's quoting from Psalm 110, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know for certain that God made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. Now, as we sing Psalm 132, we are praising God for the ascension of Jesus, who now has all authority in heaven and on earth. This is a more more difficult tune. And so since we are unable to be together tonight, I've included a recording of the tune to help you and your household sing this psalm. Uh, praising the Lord for his covenant faithfulness in raising up Jesus, the son of David. If you already know Psalm 132a, this particular tune, uh, you can still just mute um, your your TV 
and uh, sing it along. That's very important as we uh, are learning the scriptures that we uh, apply them by singing them and uh, praying them as well. In our last study, one of the questions we looked at was how Christians should think about the formation of the state of Israel in 1948. And we looked at the biblical land grant, God's giving and promise of land to Father Abraham, uh, going back to Genesis chapter 12. And then God swore to give Abraham the land in Genesis chapter 15, and then subsequent chapters to Isaac and to Jacob. And in a, Isaiah's day, which is where we're at in our, our reading, our study of the scriptures. In Isaiah's day, uh, you had the Israel in the north. They were exiled and they were taken into captivity by the Assyrians. And the south, which is where Isaiah was ministering, uh, the south is where Jerusalem, that's, it was also known as Judah. Uh, Isaiah's prophesying that they will be going into the Babylonian captivity. And he's also, pro as we're thinking about the land, the Babylonian captives, the Jews, would return from exile under King Cyrus. And Isaiah also prophesied that return. And we also have learned that after Jesus, Israel went back into exile in AD 70 and in 132 to 136 in the diaspora. And it's my understanding, uh, and certainly in keeping with Reformed theology, which we looked at last time, that the Old Covenant or the New Covenant passages in the prophets, uh, like in Jeremiah 31 and Ezekiel 36 and 37, a part of the promise of the New Covenant was that Israel would return to the land. Now, of course, they returned to the land in the Old Covenant, 
but there was always a looking forward to the coming of David's greater son. And the prophets foresaw that and spoke of it as a, a new or a newer covenant. It would be newer than the Davidic covenant. And so when Israel was declared a state in 1948, it's my understanding that this was a fulfillment of prophecy, uh, which will one day lead up to the fulfillment of the nation of Israel believing in Jesus. Last time we also looked at the first century relationship of Christianity to Judaism. Uh, we learned that the, the Messiah, Jesus, is Jewish. The founding of Christianity is Jewish, although Jewish has come to mean something different uh, after rabbinic Judaism was founded, which we talked about. Uh, but the, the foundation of Christianity, of course, goes back to the, the Jewish scriptures. It goes back to Moses and the prophets and the Psalms, which is one of the reasons we sing the Psalms. It's one of our, our wonderful, glorious inheritance from uh, the Jewish people. Now, in the first century, uh, there were, uh, at times, uh, there was a, a close relationship between Jewish Christians and Jews. But it was a very complicated relationship between believers in Jesus, uh, the Jewish Messiah, and there was a complicated relationship with Jews who did not believe in Jesus. And some Jews were on the fence. We learned last time that the book of Acts, you have thousands of men, which would have been representing thousands of Jewish households, believing in Jesus and being baptized. Many priests believed in Jesus. Uh, of course, there was persecution. One Christian, Stephen, was martyred early on. But other Jewish leaders, like Gamaliel, took a wait-and-see approach to Christianity in Acts chapter 5. So in Acts chapter 5, uh, some of the Jews of the council, the Sanhedrin, uh, wanted to put a uh, once-for-all end to the preaching of Jesus in Jerusalem. But Gamaliel stood up and he said, Stay away from these men, let them alone, for if this plan or action is of men, it will be overthrown. But if it is of God you will not be able to overthrow them or else you may even be found fighting against God. Gamaliel was a prominent Jewish rabbi and a Pharisee in the Sanhedrin. He is known outside of the, the New Testament and other Jewish tradition. He is remembered in a Jewish rabbinic tradition as Gamaliel the Elder. In fact, I have read that Gamaliel even served as the president of the Sanhedrin. Christianity, again, remember Jewish followers of Jesus the Christ, flourished in the early decades of the church in Jerusalem. And yes, there was persecution, but you would find followers of Jesus at the temple. Um, they would be preaching at the temple. They would be doing miracles in Jerusalem. My understanding is that the break between Christianity and Jews who do not believe in Jesus happened when the temple was destroyed in AD 70 and the Bar Kokhba revolt uh, around the years 132 to 136, about 100 years after Jesus and her, his earthly life. Christianity, of course, emphasized the cross. Other forms of Judaism emphasized the sword and the destruction of the Romans. Jesus' teaching about the cross was very difficult, even for his followers uh, to believe. They didn't really believe it until after his death and his resurrection. Those Jews who followed the way of the, the sword uh, these Jews ended up following a uh, this Bar Kokhba, who claimed to be the son of David, the Messiah, and fought to reclaim Jerusalem. And so Bar Kokhba and many of his followers revolted against the Romans around the year 132 AD. Uh, in fact, they were very successful initially. They annihilated a Roman legion, for example. And he goes on, <clears throat> Bar Kokhba went on to establish or tried to establish uh, an independent state, and he even began to mint his own coins. Again, there was a time that the revolt of Bar Kokhba was so successful that here you can see that they were able to begin minting their own coins. You might remember that this is a very messianic act, at least as some of the Jews were thinking during these days. You might remember that Jesus was asked about paying taxes to Caesar, and when he was asked about paying taxes to Caesar, um, he asked those who were questioning him to bring him a coin. And he then asks whose image is on the coin. And I think there's a bit of reluctance. Uh, well, Caesar's image. And Jesus said, give to Caesar what is Caesar's and to God what is God's. Well, 
Um, Bar Kokhba comes along with a very different view and messianic vision, very different understanding of the Old Testament, very different understanding, for example, of Isaiah and Psalm 22, for example. And he goes on to um, not only revolt and be successful for a little bit of time, but he begins to coin, uh, mint these coins without, of course, Caesar's image. You can notice on the coin here on the left side, um, you can see a grapevine. Uh, you can remember that that's one of the, the symbols of Israel. You might think of Jesus' parable of the vineyard. Isaiah tells a parable, uh, parables of the vineyard also. Uh, you can see on the right side, and <clears throat> um, there, there looks to be uh, maybe a, a palm branch, which of course was a sign of victory. You might remember how Jesus entered into Jerusalem. People were waving palm branches. Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And uh, it's my understanding of the silver coin here says year one of the redemption of Israel. So they, they began a new calendar according to the revolt and according to Bar Kokhba. And uh, so you can see also on the, the coin, uh, the other side of the coin says Eleazar the priest. And there's a jug with a handle and uh, again a, a branch. We'll give you another example of a coin minted during the reign of the false messiah, Bar Kokhba. Uh, on the front of the coin, there's a picture of the Temple of Jerusalem, which of course was destroyed in AD 70, um, uh, more than 50 years before Bar Kokhba. Uh, you have the Ark of the Covenant on the inside, although that was um, gone ever since the Babylonian captivity. Uh, it looks like there's a star, if you look carefully above the temple, um, that it would be my understanding is a sign of Bar Kokhba. Bar Kokhba, Kokhba is a reference to the son of the star, uh, going back to Numbers chapter 24. And this was the idea and the hope on the coin that Bar Kokhba is going to rebuild the temple. And on the reverse of the coin, on the right-hand side, you can see, I think it says, uh, year one of the redemption of, of Israel. So, of course, the, uh, during this revolt, uh, the Jews are not, the Christian Jews would have been, uh, but the <clears throat> Jews who didn't believe in Jesus and believed in a different vision of the kingdom of God and the Messiah, um, they're not paying taxes to Caesar anymore. And uh, it was their understand their, their misunderstanding that uh, the ability of Barbara Kokhba to um, have the power and the authority to mint coins and to tax, uh, of course, uh, this is uh, a sign of his uh, government. Now, here's another coin from the revolts. Uh, you have a wreath of thin branches wrapped around. It looks like there's eight almonds there, um, some kind of a medallion at the top and tendrils below. And on the reverse of the coin, on the right-hand side, you're looking at uh, what I believe says is year two of the freedom of Israel and uh, a palm branch. Uh, we talked last time about Rabbi Akiva, one of the most revered teachers in Jewish history. Not of not. Jewish Christian history, but in Jewish rabbinic history. And Rabbi Akiva declared Bar Kokhba to be the Messiah. But after this revolt uh, failed and was crushed by the Romans, Judaism had to reimagine itself without a temple and having failed to see God's salvation from the Romans. When we learned last week that the subsequent reimagination of Judaism after the failed Messianic revolt in 132 to 136, um, and then Rabbi Akiva, who again didn't know the scriptures well enough to know a true Messiah from a false Messiah who died in this period of time also, um, that we should not confuse first century Judaism before the destruction of the temple with this new form of Judaism after the destruction of the temple. That's, as we learned, one of the fundamental problems with the Messianic Jewish movement, a relatively new movement of Jewish believers in Jesus who are trying to keep their Jewish identity. But Jewish identity goes back to the centuries after Jesus, and not the century of Jesus or the centuries before Jesus. A large, the, the, there's a significant shift in understanding of Judaism uh, after uh, the temple and after Bar Kokhba and along with uh, Rabbi Akiva and his followers. So I 
commend Messianic Jews in the sense that they want to reach the Jewish people. I'm, again, I'm very grateful for that. I do too. This is very much a part of reformed uh, our reformed heritage. Um, but Messianic Judaism is trying to reach uh, these rabbinic Jews um, by holding on to this rabbinic identity that goes back to a false messiah and back to Rabbi Akiva. But nevertheless, God does have a plan for the Jewish nation, and that plan, of course, is centered on Jesus the Christ, the Son of God, the Son of David, who now sits at the right hand of God the Father. Meaning, of course, that there is no place for anti-Semitism in any Christian theology. Now, unfortunately, that hasn't always been the case historically, um, but it is completely, it's a, it's a counterfeit Christianity that is anti-Semitic. Now, this, of course, ties into Isaiah because Isaiah is speaking of the future of the Jewish nation. He's speaking the, uh, the servant songs there will be in the, the mystery uh, of God and his providence that the stone that the builders rejected would become the chief cornerstone. And so <clears throat> we're, we're looking in Isaiah at the, the age in which we uh, now live. And, uh, but we should remember to give thanks to God for the preservation of ethnic Israel and for their return to the land in 1948 and praying that they will believe in Jesus um, and one day say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Well, today we continue on with our study of Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 51. And as we begin, let's ask for the Lord's blessing in our time. Our gracious and heavenly Father, we thank you so very much for the sending of your son, Jesus. We thank you, Jesus, that you are the Christ. We thank you for the age in which we live, in which the law is going forth from Zion and your light to the ends of the earth. And we pray for the work of the Holy Spirit. We pray for the ingathering of the, the Gentiles and uh, your elect people. And we also pray for uh, the return of and the restoration of Israel, national Israel, and a, a, a large-scale national repentance, that they would be putting their faith and trust in you. We pray that you'd use our lives and use your word for these ends and for your glory, as it is our desire that the knowledge of the glory of the Lord would cover the earth as the waters cover the sea. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I invite you to follow along as we read Isaiah 51. You can grab your Bible, and I'll be reading from the NASB 95. And notice that the text will be telling us to pay attention. Pay also attention to who the speaker is as chapter 51 goes back and forth from Isaiah to the, the Lord speaking. And uh, sometimes it's Isaiah, sometimes it's Zion. And there it seems may, maybe even a, a collective prophetic voice. Beginning with verse 1, hear the living word of the living God. Listen to me, you who pursue righteousness, who seek the Lord. Look to the, Lord, look to the rock from which you were hewn, and to the quarry from which you were dug. Look to Abraham your father, and to Sarah who gave birth to you in pain. When he was but one, I called him. Then I blessed him and multiplied him. Indeed, the Lord will comfort Zion he will comfort all her waste places, and her wilderness he will make like Eden, and her desert like the garden of the Lord. Joy and gladness will be found in her, thanksgiving and sound of a melody. Pay attention to me, O my people, and give ear to me, O my nation, for a law will go forth from me, and I will set my justice for a light of the peoples. My righteousness is near. My salvation has gone forth, and my arms will judge the peoples. The coastlands will wait for me, and for my arm they will wait expectantly. Lift up your eyes to the sky, then look to the earth beneath, for the sky will vanish like smoke, and the earth will wear out like a garment, and its inhabitants will die in like manner. But my salvation will be forever and my righteousness will not wane. A people in whose heart is my law, do not fear the reproach of men, nor be dismayed at their revilings. For the moth will eat them like a garment, and the grub will eat them like wool, but my righteousness will be forever, and my salvation 
to all generations. Awake, awake, put on strength, O arm of the Lord. Awake, as in the days of old, the generations of long ago. Was it not you who cut Rahab in pieces, who pierced the dragon? Was it not you who dried up the sea, the waters of the great deep, who made the depths of the sea a pathway for the redeemed to cross over? So the ransomed of the Lord will return and come with joyful shouting to Zion, and everlasting joy will be on their heads. They will obtain gladness and joy, and sorrow and sighing will flee away. I, even I, am he who comforts you. Who are you that you are afraid of man who dies, and of the Son of Man who is like grass? That you have forgotten the Lord your Maker who stretched out the heavens and laid the foundations of the earth? That you fear continually all day long because of the fury of the oppressor as he makes ready to destroy? But where is the fury of the oppressor? The exile will soon be set free and will not die in the dungeon, nor will his bread be lacking. For I am the Lord your God, who stirs up the sea and its waves roar. The Lord of hosts is his name. I have put my words in your mouth and have covered you with the shadow of my hand to establish the heavens, to found the earth, and to say to, say to Zion, you are my people. Rouse yourself. Rouse yourself, arise, O Jerusalem, you who have drunk from the Lord's hand the cup of his anger, the chalice of reeling you have drained to the dregs. There is none to guide her among all the sons she has borne, nor is there one to take her by the hand among all the sons she has reared. These two things have befallen you. Who will mourn for you? The devastation and destruction, famine and sword. How shall I comfort you? Your sons have fainted. They lie helpless at the head of every street, like an antelope in a net, full of the wrath of the Lord, the rebuke of your God. Therefore, please hear this, you afflicted, who are drunk but not with wine. Thus says your Lord, the Lord, even your God, who contends for his people. Behold, I have taken out of your hand the cup of reeling, the chalice of my anger, you will never drink it again. I will put it into the hand of your tormentors, who have said to you, Lie down, that we may walk over you. You have ma- even made your back like the ground and like the street for those who walk over it. Now here's where chapter 51 concludes. <clears throat> now let's look back to verses 1 through 3. And I want to ask the, the following questions of the text. So as you're looking at verses 1 through 3, this is God's encouragement, I want to ask the the questions, who is speaking in verse 1, and who is being addressed in verse 1? And as you uh, answer these questions in verse 1, I'll give you uh, a minute, maybe you want to read uh, verse 1 or verses 1 through 3 aloud, and answer these questions for yourself. Again, looking at who is speaking in verse 1, who is being addressed in verse 1. Now, hopefully you have the answers. That the one who is speaking in verse 1, hopefully you said, is, is God. It is the Lord. Uh, it, was, it is Yahweh, the covenant God of Israel. And who is being addressed in verse 1? It is God's people. It is the righteous remnant. Or more specifically, those who pursue righteousness. Those who seek the Lord are being addressed in verse 1. Now, we can make an important application at this point. Not all Israel in Isaiah's day were interested in pursuing righteousness. Not all the kings of Isaiah's day, leading up to the Babylonian captivity, sought the Lord. And this is going to become important later in the chapter. Not all the prophets Not all the priests were pursuing God's righteousness. Now, 
In the Babylonian captivity, not all the Jews would seek the Lord. It would be a remnant. And we can make application of these verses to ourselves. Are you pursuing righteousness? Are you seeking the Lord? Because it's possible right now, even as you're studying the word of God, for your heart not to be here. Your heart can be very far away from paying attention and listening, as the text says, repeatedly. So pray for your, yourself. Pray for your own personal life, your household, our congregation, that we would be purposeful and intent on seeking the Lord and his righteousness. Just because you belong to the people of God doesn't mean that your heart belongs to the Lord. Think of Matthew 6, 33. Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. Now, God says to those who are pursuing righteousness and seeking the Lord, he reminds them to look to Abraham. Listen to me, verse 1, you who pursue righteousness, who seek the Lord, look to the rock from which you are hewn and to the quarry from which you were dug. Look to Abraham your father and to Sarah who gave birth to you in pain. When he was but one, I called him, then I blessed him and multiplied him. Why Abraham at this point in verse 2? Well, it's because from Abraham and Sarah that the Jewish nation was born. Abraham, in, in addition to this, Abraham is the father of righteousness. Pursuing righteousness, right? It's a righteousness that is by faith. And Paul will discuss this in Romans chapter 9 through 11. Now, <clears throat> remember, Abraham had no children. His wife was barren. She was beyond the age of childbearing. And yet he believed when God said, Abraham in, in Genesis chapter 15, look at the stars, count them if you're able, so shall your offspring be. And Genesis 15, 6 says that Abraham believed the Lord and it was reckoned to him as righteousness. Uh, Abraham had no land, but God promised lands to Abraham in that very same chapter. And when God then walked through that blood path, that imprecatory oath that the Lord took upon himself saying, Abraham, I swear by myself that I will fulfill this covenant. Think of Genesis chapter 22. Uh, and again, this is what Isaiah is inviting us to do. He's inviting us to go back to Abraham and Sarah. But you think of Genesis 22 and Abraham offering up Isaac as a burnt offering and, and learning there about how God would provide for his people. Remember, Abraham, you righteous, God is saying through Isaiah that these things because God is going to fulfill his promise through his son, Jesus, the greater son of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. It would be through the servant of the Lord. And this is part of the great comfort God has been speaking to his people ever since Isaiah chapter 40. Indeed, in verse 3 of our text now, Indeed, the Lord will comfort Zion. He will comfort all her waste places and her wilderness. He will make like Eden and her desert like the garden of the Lord. Joy and gladness will be found in her. Thanksgiving and sound of a melody. So I want to ask you the question. Do you know the comfort of the gospel through faith in Jesus? Moving on to verses 4 through 8, I want you to look over these verses, read them aloud if you need to, and try to answer the following questions from verses 4 through 8. What is going forth from God and to whom? In verse 4, how does God describe his salvation? In verse 6, and how does God describe those who do not trust in his everlasting salvation? In verses 7 and 8. And I'll give you a, a minute to read. Again, you might want to read these aloud and uh, try to answer these questions. The questions are on the left that I want you to answer from verses 4, 6, and 7, and 8. And the, the text of Isaiah is on the right.
Did you get the answers? Where, or what is going forth in, from God and to whom in verse four? So what's going forth is the, the law of God and God's justice. And who is it for? To whom? It is uh, a light for or a light of the peoples according to verse four. This is a reference to the Gentiles. The, the peoples here are not Jews. They are the ends of the earth. And again, the gospel is always included, not just the seed of Abraham, but that those who bless the seed of Abraham would find salvation also. And <clears throat> so there, there in verse four, pay attention to me, O my people, give ear to me, O my nation, for a law will go forth from me and I will set my justice for a light of the peoples. And that's the age, that's the day in which we now live. And this happened, the question is, when does this happen? It happened at the day of Pentecost when Jesus was lifted up he said, I will draw all men to myself. The book of Acts begins with the, the church beginning in Jerusalem and then going from Jerusalem to Judea to Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Looking at verse 6 of our text, how does God describe his salvation? And here in verse 6, God describes his salvation as everlasting. In fact, it will outlast the current heavens and the earth. In fact, when Jesus returns, there will be a new heavens and a new earth. And in verses 7 and 8, we ask the question, how does God describe those who do not trust in his everlasting salvation? And the answer is destruction. <clears throat> those who do not trust are described as being food for worms. In fact, that's how the book of Isaiah uh, will conclude. Um, it is a, a return back to the dust. And uh, in the next chapter, we'll see that God will raise Israel from the dust. God created us from dust for glory. Uh, but that glory comes through in having the faith of Father Abraham, who saw the day of Christ and was glad. So God's salvation is for the seed of Abraham and for the nations. His salvation, and, and as you're thinking of salvation, it's God's righteousness. It's the justice of the cross. And it is for all, all generations. And I want to ask you the question, all important question, do you know this righteousness that comes through faith in Jesus? Now in verses 9 through 11, we have what, what, what we might call divine intervention. And it's a divine intervention that is described in terms of the Exodus. And it seems to me that the speaker here is now the prophet Isaiah. In fact, it seems to be a kind of prayer. And I've added these verses to how I pray for the salvation of the fullness of the Gentiles and the ingathering of the Jews, as Jesus taught us to pray in the Lord's Prayer, thy kingdom come. Put on strength, O arm of the Lord. Awake, as in the days of old, the generations of long ago, was it not you who cut Rahab in pieces, who pierced the dragon? So there you hopefully hear echoes of Genesis chapter 3, Pharaoh and the Exodus, perhaps even David and Goliath. I would include righteous Job in this also. Verse 10, was it not you who dried up the sea, the waters of the great deep, who made the depths of the sea a pathway for the redeemed to cross over? Uh, this is an unmistakable reference to the Exodus. But now Isaiah is prophesying a second or a greater Exodus. And now it's not only the Jews who will be saved, but the nations. And you have to love verse 11 here. Joy, joy, gladness, and joy. You know, what, what comfort. Verse 11, so the ransomed of the Lord will return. Again, here's this second Exodus. It's an exile, not just from the Babylonian captivity, but humanity's exile, humanity's separation from God. There is a return and come with joyful shouting to Zion and everlasting joy will be on their heads. They will obtain gladness and joy and sorrow and sighing will flee away. It reminds me of uh, Paul saying, <clears throat> come quickly, Lord Jesus, Revelation chapter 21, no more death or mourning or crying or pain uh, for the old order of things will have passed away. 
These verses are God's a call, a prayer for God's divine intervention. And then they are followed in verses 12 through 16 with divine comfort. Looking at verse 12, where the Lord is now speaking, I, <clears throat> even I, am he who comforts you. Note the emphatic use of I that Yahweh uses. I, even I, am he who comforts you. Uh, here, again, it's the, the triune God who comforts his people in the new covenant. This is notably the work of God, the Holy Spirit. Uh, as you remember, the Holy Spirit is another like Jesus, and the Holy Spirit is a divine comforter. Jesus says in John chapter 14 and verses 16 and 17, um, shortly before his death, his resurrection and ascension, I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper, sometimes this is translated as a comforter, and that he may be with you forever, the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it does not see or know him, but you know him, because he abides with you and will be with you. In John chapter 14 and verse 26, But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I said you, to you. John 15, Jesus taught in verse 26, When the Helper, the, the Paraclete, the Comforter, comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, that is the Spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father, he will testify about me. And in John chapter 16 and verse 7, But I tell you the truth, it is to your advantage that I go away, for if I do not go away, the Helper, the Comforter, the Holy Spirit, the, the Paraclete, will not come to you, but if I go, I will send him to you. Many times we can lose sight of God's comfort. And when we lose sight of God's comfort, and this is where, where Isaiah is going with this, um, that when we lose sight of God's comfort, we will not be trusting in the Lord, and we will end up fearing man. Verse 12 goes on to say, after God says, I, even I, am he who comforts you, who are you that you are afraid of man who dies, and of the Son of Man who is made like grass? Who are you that you are afraid again, of man? So here's the, the, the difference between God and man, <clears throat> You're, the, the comfort here is put, put your trust in the Lord. Don't keep your eyes fixed on mortal man. Don't keep your eyes fixed on how it seems that your oppressor is always winning. He won't. Verse 13, that you have forgotten the Lord, your maker, who stretched out the heavens and laid the foundations of the earth, that you fear continually all day long because of the fury of the oppressor as he makes ready to destroy. But where is the fury of the oppressor? These verses remind us earlier in Isaiah chapter put his trust in the Lord and not look to the Assyrians and not look to Tiglath-Pileser to deliver him. But you remember how he trembled and, and how he ends up putting his trust in the Lord. And basically, the servant of the Lord, Ahaz, says to Tiglath-Pileser, I am your servant. I am your son. He was supposed to be fearing and trusting in the Lord. So now, <clears throat> the point that God is making is that when we give in to fear, we forget the Lord. We stop trusting. Those, though, who learn God's comfort will be steadfast in their trust and obedience to him. God goes on to comfort his people who seek him and pursue his righteousness, saying in verse 14, the exile, or more, perhaps more literally, the, the one in chains. And I understand the exile here in verse 14, and I'll explain a little bit more why. It's not just a reference to Babylon, uh, but this is an exile, again, from the Garden of Eden. This is an exile in, in chains to the devil. So the, the exile, these chains, will soon be set free. And will not die in the dungeon, nor will his bread be lacking. For I am the Lord your God, who stirs up the sea and its waves roar. The Lord of hosts is his name. I have put my words in your mouth, and have covered you with the shadow of my hand to establish the heavens, to be found, 
to found the earth and to say to Zion, you are my people. Those are the words of the covenant. I will be your God and you will be my people. And then chapter 51 ends with the cup of wrath and further words of comfort. Now these are are difficult verses and they require a great deal of historic sensitivity to the suffering of God's people, not only in the Babylonian captivity, but in subsequent centuries after that, as the Jewish people and nation have been marked on many occasions by unimaginable suffering and loss. So how are we to understand here in verse 21, the removal of God's cup of wrath? So some interpretations of Isaiah chapter 51 may limit the prophecies and the promises in this section to only the return from Babylonian exile, which occurred in the 6th century BC. Now, certainly this is part of the background of Isaiah, but I don't think anyone who is seeking the Lord and pursuing his righteousness and comfort can be satisfied Because the return from Babylonian exile is not a sufficient uh, event to ultimately satisfy and comfort God's people. So, verse 21, Therefore, please hear this, you afflicted, who are drunk but not with wine. Thus says your Lord, the Lord even your God, who contends for his people, Behold, I have taken out of your hand the cup of reeling, the chalice of my anger. You will never drink it again. I will put it into the hand of your tormentors who have said to you, Lie down, that we may walk over you. You have even made your back like the ground and like the street for those who walk over it. My understanding of these verses, as as this is coming to a conclusion of Isaiah chapter 51, is that in the Old Covenant, the nation of Israel, including the righteous remnant, suffered greatly because of the sins of the Davidic king. Let me give you a brief sampling of how God's righteous remnant suffered under the hands of, for the very fact that their Davidic king was not faithful. King David, uh, when he took a census of Israel in 2 Samuel 24, it's also recorded in 1 Chronicles 21, 70,000 people died for that unrighteous act. There's a lot of suffering. Um, Solomon's idolatry, high places in 1 Kings chapter 11. Or think of Rehoboam's oppression and heavy yoke leading to the division of the north and the south uh, from Israel and Judah in 1 Kings chapter 12. Or Ahaz, who is, uh, again, one of the contemporary kings of Isaiah's day. Ahaz was one of the most idolatrous kings. He introduced various pagan practices, including uh, the worship of Baal. He made molten images for the Baals. He burned incense in the valley of Ben-Hinnom. He even sacrificed his children by fire, following the detestable practices of the nations. This is a son of David, or Joash, Initially, Joash was a righteous king, but after the death of Jehoiada, the priest, he listened to the officials of Judah and abandoned the house of the Lord to serve idols, and he abandoned the true worship of the one true God. Uh, Manasseh, uh, he erected altars for Baal. He worshipped all the starry hosts. He built altars in the temple courts. He practiced child sacrifice, divination, witchcraft. This is the son of Hezekiah. Uh, Manasseh also shed much innocent blood of God. In fact, according to tradition, not in the scriptures, but a tradition coming uh, long after Isaiah, uh, there's a tradition that it was Manasseh who had the prophet Isaiah sawn in half. So how are we to understand the removal of God's cup of wrath here in Isaiah 51? What is the comfort of this passage for Israel Because return from Babylonian exile did not end their affliction. My understanding is that Isaiah is not just speaking here about 
a return from Babylonian exile, but he foresees the day of Jesus, the servant of the Lord, the son of David, the king of kings and Lord of lords, who himself would drink the cup of reeling and the chalice of God's anger for the sins of his people. There will never again, never again, because Jesus has overcome and he sits now at the right hand of God the Father. Jesus' obedience is what we remember in the Lord's Supper when we drink from the cup, a cup of blessing representing his blood. We drink through faith and by faith we drink the cup of blessing because Jesus, our King, drank from the cup of wrath, the cup that we deserve, that cup of death even everlasting separation from the blessed presence of God. You think of Jesus in Gethsemane in Matthew chapter 27, praying and saying in his prayer to the Lord, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. Now remember, Isaiah 51 began with a return from exile spoken of in terms of the Garden of Eden, And through Jesus, the head of the serpent has been crushed. Sin and the curse has been dealt with decisively once and for all. Today, remember Jesus could say to the thief on the cross, today you will be with me in paradise. Have you trusted Jesus? Are you a part of his bride, the church? And do you drink from the cup of blessing? And there's a warning here in Isaiah as it comes to an end. If you don't drink from that that cup of blessing, the wrath of God remains on you. Next time, Lord willing, we will continue with Isaiah chapter 52, looking at the joy of Christ's victory. Again, not just a return from the Babylonian exile. It will be a, and it is a return from exile for both Jews and Gentiles through Jesus Christ, the son of David, the servant of the Lord. And Isaiah chapter 52 will also begin the fourth and final servant song. So let's close in prayer. Please join with me. Our gracious and heavenly Father, we praise and thank you so very much that you and your love sent your son Jesus, that you are the father of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We thank you for Isaiah's promises and his prayers um, calling you Uh, to awaken. And we thank you that we live in that age in which you have awakened. Uh, We praise and worship you as you are the one who has cut Rahab in pieces and pierced the dragon. Uh, We thank you that you have dried up the sea, the waters, the great deep. And it's not just for the return of uh, the, the Jews from Egypt to the promised land that you gave to Father Abraham. We thank you for the salvation and the redemption that crosses over from death into life through the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you that these prophecies of the ransomed of the Lord returning, uh, we thank you that this is the age that we now live. We pray for the joy of the Holy Spirit, uh, this everlasting joy that is upon our heads. We thank you for uh, the hope of sorrow and sighing, uh, one day fleeing away completely. So we pray, Lord, that you would bless this study to our own pursuit of righteousness and seeking after you and your kingdom, uh, desiring that thy kingdom would come and that thy will would be done on earth as it is in heaven. Uh, We pray that you continue to gather your people through missions and evangelism from the ends of the earth. And we pray that you would use this study to prepare us uh, for this coming Lord's Day uh, when we anticipate Uh, assembling before your blessed presence in the name of Jesus to worship in spirit and truth. And we ask these things in his name. Amen.